So I want to talk today about uh, behavioral finance or about psychology and finance. Uh, this is uh, a long-standing interest of mine. Uh, I've been involved with it for over 20 years. Uh, it's not really emphasized in your textbook. Uh, so Fabozzi and the, his co-authors talk about a lot of things in the financial world, but not about the underlying human behavior. Uh, behavioral finance, or behavioral economics more broadly, is a, a kind of revolution that has occurred in uh, finance and economics over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and it remains somewhat controversial. Uh, I don't quite fully understand why it is that people polarize as much as they do, but some people don't like this. Uh, other people, uh, I think, um, we're, we're coming along to be the majority, I think. People are now regarding behavioral finance as an important element of finance. Uh, and so, the, the real problem is that uh, people are complex, and our, our financial institutions, as I've emphasized, are designed for real people, and their functioning depends on the behavior of, uh, of real people. And it's not a simple, you know, one revolu another revolution that's occurring parallel, a bigger, of bigger significance, is a revolution in neuroscience about the human brain. And uh, the human brain is a very complicated organ. Uh, and it's simp it's not, economists have liked to invoke the principle of rationality as an underlying component of their theory. And that has been useful, but it's of limited use because people aren't rational. <laughs> they're often rational, they're not completely rational. And uh, very often people behave stupidly. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, that includes everyone, including me. Uh, because of, we're human and we have limits. And uh, uh, that encourages, one thing about the human species is that we are aware of other people's weaknesses and have an impulse to exploit them. Okay, so when you see other people behaving stupidly, sometimes you think, maybe I can turn this to my advantage. Okay. Uh, and that, uh, that becomes a, uh, a problem. Uh, the history of humankind is a history of exploitation of one person by another. Uh, not entirely, but I'm saying it has that as an important element. Uh, so I'm going to talk about these human failings. It's not to say that people are stupid. I'm just saying they're people, right? And we're all imperfect. We're smart in some dimensions. and. We can be very smart, but we can also uh, make important mistakes. But I've, before I start, I wanted to uh, try to put this into uh, a perspective, because I, uh, maybe I'll return to this at the end of the lecture. But the, uh, I wanted to start on, a, on an upbeat note. I'm going to talk about all kinds of human errors. But I wanted to start on an upbeat note um, that uh, the business world generally doesn't exploit people terribly, I believe. Uh, that uh, very characteristically successful businesses in finance and elsewhere uh, consider their long-term advantage and the reputation they have. So doing something that is blatantly exploitative of human weaknesses will work against their long-term advantage. Uh, and so we don't see, you'll see a lot of human failings, but we don't see people um, cashing in on them as often as you'd think. And, and beyond that, I want to emphasize also that p another aspect of human behavior is morality. Uh, evolutionary biologists think that this evolved uh, along with our other traits, that we have an impulse to be moral. 
And so in the long run, you might not really gain so much satisfaction from exploiting other people's mistakes. Uh, and so you don't, um, you don't necessarily do that. So that's why we'll have a lot of uh, weaknesses outlined, and, and we won't see uh, significant or serious exploitation of them as characteristic. Now, I, I, as you know, I have chapters from my forthcoming book assigned for this course, and I look back on what I put up uh, for you to read, and uh, I keep thinking, gee, I, <laughs> this really wasn't ready. So I had a chapter uh, for this section of the reading list uh, about behavioral finance. Uh, and I, I, I thought, I didn't really get it right. I, I know what I was trying to say, but maybe I should. Uh, what I start out in, in that chapter is talking about Adam Smith, okay, uh, and his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Now, just to remind you, Adam Smith was a professor uh, at, uh, uh, I guess, in, in Scotland um, that. Uh, in 1759, he was a professor of moral philosophy because there were no professors of economics in those days. Uh, and he wrote in 1759, maybe I should write some of this on the board. Uh, so uh, he's probably the most important figure in the history of economic thought. Uh, so in 1759, he wrote his Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, and in 1776, he wrote the more famous book, Wealth of Nations. So this is the Theory of Moral Sentiments. The uh, Wealth of Nations uh, is considered the, the first real uh, treatise on economics, and it's a wonderful book, and it's still very readable today. Uh, his m theory of moral sentiments is not so widely read, but it's not really economics. It's a book about psychology and morality, it's, and I, I find it um, very good, <laughs> even 250 years later. Uh, he went through many editions on this book because he thought maybe he thought it was his most important work, but the book starts out about selfishness and altruism, and the, the real question which he thinks uh, defines economics is: uh, Are people really completely selfish? Sometimes it seems that way, that their presumed uh, benevolence is just an artifice for their own benefit. Uh, uh, but he wonders, how does an economy work if everyone is totally selfish? And he ends up concluding that they're not. And I thought it was very interesting the way he put it. The thing he emphasized right at the beginning of the book is that people inherently love praise. All right? We crave the <laughs> approval of other people. Uh, and so praise is a fundamental human desire. But then he reflected on it and he said, do people really want praise itself, or is it something else that they want? Uh, and he said that, well, think of it this way. Suppose people made a big mistake and thought that you had accomplished something, but there was an, a mix-up. You know, it was really somebody else who did it, not you. And it's just a complete mistake. You had nothing to do with it. But you find lots of people praising you. W would that really be pleasurable? Uh, and if, suppose you even know that they'll never find out that I didn't do it. Well, Smith said, it probably isn't, right? I mean, think about it. You internally are thinking, I'm getting all this praise, but I, don't, I know I don't deserve it, so I don't enjoy it. And then he went on to say that, especially among people who are more mature, he says more mature people, not everyone makes this step, but he says adults, normal, mature adults, make a transition from a desire for praise to a desire for praiseworthiness. I want to know that I am the kind of person who will be praised, and I don't need to get the praise. And he said, it's that tendency, ultimately, which makes an economy work, that people don't care just about praise. And he gives an example of mathematicians. 
and he said he's known many mathematicians in his life, and he finds that they're almost all obscure. The public doesn't know about mathematicians. They couldn't explain to the public what they do. And they don't seem to care at all, because they, they know the public doesn't appreciate mathematics. And so they, there, there's a few mathematician friends who understand what they do and may praise them. But ultimately, a mathematician can sometimes do the work completely unknown, you know, uh, writing it, and it's, it's the praiseworthiness that, uh, that drives these people. So I think that, I, uh, you may think that I'm being too idealistic <laughs> when I say this, but I think that uh, the finance profession, uh, and this is what I was trying to say in that chapter, that the finance profession, like other mature professions, is really dominated, although there's a lot of funny things that happen, that is really dominated by people who have reached this uh, desire for praiseworthiness. And so you're not going to exploit people extravagantly just because why would I do that? It's just not a good thing. I wouldn't feel good about it. Uh, though some people will. Now I wanted to also mention not everyone reaches this mature state that Adam Smith uh, Adam Smith describes. And that's one of the complexities of human society. And I think that the finance profession has a problem with other kinds of people. Now, there's a whole branch of psychology called personality psychology that categorizes people by their personality. And we're not all the same. And in our, in our society, uh, we have many different kinds of personalities. The, the, a successful society promotes people up who have the praiseworthiness desire. We try to recognize them, and we try to put people of character into uh, important positions with limit, not complete success. But I wanted to just briefly talk about, this is a t lecture on psychology, uh, and I wanted to talk about other personality types that are, uh, and I was going to use uh, a book called The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 4, published by the American Psychiatric Association. They're coming out with a fifth edition in 2014. Uh, DSM-4 is kind of a household word around my house because my wife is a psychologist. <laughs> <And so, laughs> um, DSM-4 is actually controversial among psychiatrists because it's too cut and dried for some of them. What it tries to do is identify mental illnesses and personality types in a quantifiable, reproducible way so that we can define who has this mental illness or who has this personality type. Uh, and so it gives you checklists and it says, you know, uh, the patient must have, experienced, have exhibited at least three of the following five behaviors. And then there'll be another checklist uh, and so you keep scoring. You can, uh, you can actually diagnose personality disorder. I, I'm just going to mention one. They have many personality disorders. Uh, one of them is called APD, called antisocial personality disorder. Um, and so they have checklists. But just to give you a sense, uh, oh, and the anti, antisocial personality disorder is called psychopathy. Or one kind of AT APD is psychopathy. Another one is called sociopathy. Uh, and I, I don't know, there's a huge literature on these. But according to uh, DSM 4, 3% of the male population in the world is APD, okay? And 1% of the female population. Um, a simple definition for APD is. A jerk, okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are more male jerks than female jerks, uh, apparently, according to their, um, their. This is all quantifiable and done. But what is an a, what is an anti-social po personality disorder? It has the following characteristics: lack of remorse, frequent lying, lack of empathy, superficial charm, shallowed emotions. Distorted sense of self, constant search for new sensations. Have you met someone like that? You probably have, 
because that's 3% of the population. Um, I'm not anti-male when I point out there are three times as many jerks among males as females. Females have characteristically different personality disorders, and you can look down the list. So it's much more than 3% of the population that would be diagnosed with one or the other. So you know what an APD person is? Manipulative, feigns uh, affectionate or warm feelings but doesn't feel them, and is trying to deceive you. And uh, uh, I encountered one. Once a student came to my office and, and asked to sign up as my research assistant. And I, I was talking to him. I thought, well, maybe, you know. I said, come back and talk. And later on, I read about him in the Yale Daily News. He was an imposter student. He was not a <laughs> Yale student. And he had been around to other university campuses. He was an imposter at like three different campuses. So there's something wrong with this person, right? Uh, <laughs> Kind of made me feel. And then he came later and asked me for a recommendation letter. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, after I read about him in the Yale Daily News, uh, but uh, those are this is extreme, right? And so, uh, incidentally, someone did a study of APD by going to a prison and categorizing the uh, inmates using DSM-4 standards, and they found that 40 percent of the prisoners had APD. Also, neuroscience people have found that there are differences in the prefrontal cortex that are correlated with APD. So it seems to be, it's a problem we have in our society that some people have a brain structure that's a little different, and it may make it difficult for them to behave in a good way. So the, 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 the um, we're learning more and more about neuroscience. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that Adam Smith's book still rings true, though, after there's some basic common sense that we all learn, that you have to judge people, and you have to learn their character. And you have to be a person of character, for in the long run, that's what you want. Uh, it gives you what you want in life. Uh, so. Uh, So, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to turn now to, oh, and another thing I want to say at the beginning is that people are manipulable, unfortunately true. And unfortunately, we live in a world where it's hard to <coughs> avoid manipulating people at all because you've, we have a free enterprise system that encourages competition. And if the competition is manipulating people, how do you completely stay clear of that? Uh, and I think this is one of the contradictions of our society. And, and a very simple and obvious manipulation is they'll, they'll put a price on some item they're selling, like $9.99, all right? So you ask, well, why didn't they just say $10, right? Well, you know why they didn't. It's called pricing points in, in marketing. Because $9.99 sounds a lot less psychologically than $10. So everyone does it. Almost everyone does it. Um, but uh, is that bad? Well, it's bad in a way. It's manipulative, isn't it? I mean, I, I'm annoyed by it. Or maybe you are, too. But if you were in business, would you uh, do that, too? You might feel that you have to. And it's a harmless sort of manipulation. Right, it's not hurting anyone, really. They may be buying a little bit more than they, uh, than they want. But you see, that's the kind of thing that, um, uh, that comes in. So you, in, in looking at financial institutions, they're often manipulative in that sense. Uh, but I don't think that, that it's, it's similar to a politician. If, if you want to be a, a member of Congress or whatever, you can't say what you really believe, right? because you won't get elected. Uh, you, you've got to kind of doctor your, uh, public, uh, your opinions to the public opinion. Uh, and, and so, otherwise you won't have, but you might have a moral purpose underlying it all because you want to get elected so you can do good things. And uh, uh, so you do end up saying things. So it's hard to judge people, good or bad. It's, it's an overall sense you get of someone's character that people are doing things that appear somewhat manipulative and somewhat bad, 
but you get an overall sense of the person through time, and that's uh, uh, and ultimately our society within limits rewards people that show character uh, through all the confusing uh, details. Now I wanted to move. That, that was my introduction. I wanted to move now to discussing some particular aspects of behavioral finance, uh, or more broadly, behavioral economics, and about human failings that uh, are exploitable by somebody, but uh, um, that uh, and are somewhat exploited, but um, remain as. Uh, I wanted to start out with what's probably the most famous element of, of behavioral economics. It's pro prospect theory. Uh, and it was invented by two uh, psychologists, Danny, or Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Uh, and uh, in the uh, late 20th century. Uh, they called it prospect theory because it was a theory of how people form decisions about prospects. And a prospect is a, a gamble. It's about people's decisions under uncertainty. Uh, and in very simple terms, the prospect theory s says, now there's a huge literature on this, so I'm trying to give you a very, uh, a very quick uh, uh, description of it, that there's something called a value function, which represents how people uh, value things. And there's a weighting function. That's the two parts, uh, which shows how people uh, infer or how they deal with probabilities. OK, and I'll just show simply what the Kahneman and Tversky says, I'll, I'll draw a picture of the value function and the weighting function. And this will be very quick, and you'd have to read more. But the way people value gains or losses, uh, let me say, how do I uh, better draw the line in the middle? OK, and these we're talking about financial gains. So these are gains. And this is zero, and this is losses. Well, negative. What I have on the horizontal axis is wealth or money or something like that. Zero in the middle. Okay. <coughs> and then we have on this axis value, which is something like utility. Uh, I'll erase my zero. It doesn't get in the way. And what they find is that people's value has a funny shape. We don't weigh gains and losses linearly. Uh, in the positive quadrant, when we have positive gains, there's diminishing value like that. Uh, it doesn't ever slope down. It's concave down, like diminishing marginal utility in economic theory. But for losses, it looks something like this, it's concave up. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this is a diagram that Kahneman and Tversky wrote uh, in their famous uh, Econometrica article 30 years ago. So there's diminishing marginal utility for gains, but there's uh, the opposite. Uh, well, we have concave up. <laughs> Well, and, th and there's a kink. You note that uh, the, the value function has a kink at the origin. Uh, so what does this mean? It means, and, and then, OK, first of all, this origin is a, what is, wh from what point do I estimate gains and losses? That's called the reference point, and it's psychological. And it's subject to manipulation. The reference point is the zero from which I measure things. The kink, uh, so, so that first of all, it's th the reference point is probably today's wealth, but it can be something else if people are manipulated. 
by the, the way something is presented to them. Framing, according to Kahneman and Tversky, is presentation. So I can give the same uh, prospect to people, but word it in different ways that suggests a different reference point, and that will change people's behavior. So you can manipulate people by describing something in different terms, uh, by suggesting a different reference point. But typically, the reference point is today's wealth. The kink means that people are very conscious of little changes in their wealth, and they're spooked by them. I'm really afraid because my value drops very rapidly, even for a small loss. So if you were to say, lose uh, five dollars this morning, all right, you had it in your pocket and you lost it on the way to this lecture, you would feel exaggeratedly bad about that. You should really regard five dollars as just nothing, because the present value of your lifetime income is in the millions, so what's five dollars? But you don't think that way. And so you're, you're spooked and deterred by small losses, uh, and less, and less uh, encouraged by small gains. So th this kind of thing allows business people to exploit people if they want to. If people are so <coughs> focused on these little changes, then you are encouraged in business to try to incur uh, uh, pick things out that people are paying attention to, like small things, and sell insurance policies on just those things. Uh, and, and so uh, insurance should be concentrated on the really big things, like life insurance, you know, the fact that one of your uh, parents could die and the children's family would be out of money for the rest of their lives. That's a big thing. But it may not work to sell that kind of insurance. You can do something. Uh, that is more focused on what people are watching and make it something little so that it doesn't require them to spend so much money. The, the classic example of that is funeral insurance. Okay. You go around telling people, if for some reason this sales pitch works, and it's worked for thousands of years, they sold this in ancient Rome. Right? You tell people, you know, if someone in your family dies, you could have an expense of getting a proper burial for this person. <laughs> it costs money. And so they would insure that one thing, okay? Uh, and it was a little thing, so, um, but it works to sell that. Another an example of that is airline flight insurance, okay? You are insured for this flight on the airplane, okay? I heard an ad for funeral insurance recently. They're, they're, they're still doing this after 2,000 years, because it still works, and it's manipulative. That's not what you should do for people. You should not pick out some little thing. Or they also have diamond mm -hmm. ring insurance. After an engagement, some women will want to buy an insurance policy on the diamond, because it can actually fall out of your ring and you lose it. But that's like, what is it, $5,000? something? It's not big. It's not essential. And if you're insuring that and not other things, you're making a mistake. But fortunately, the insurance industry is not too, it, it has come around to do things that are more, they are doing things that matter and are big. And that's because this Kahneman-Tversky value function is an asp it's a, it represents an error that people are prone to be making, but it's not total and not complete. Uh, and so ultimately, People don't go to insurance companies that manipulate them. It gets around, and eventually people come around to wanting something better. And so uh, while there is some manipulation, it's limited. Uh, the other aspect of Kahneman and Tversky is the weighting function. Okay? And, uh, and it's, I'm going to draw again a picture of it. Uh, and it's this time, it's how people psychologically think about probabilities. And this again is Kahneman and Tversky. A probability is a number between 0 and 1, or 0 and 100%. I'll put 0 here and 1 here. We can tell someone the probability of something, but they can't accept it psychologically. The errors that people make 
are described by the weighting function. What the weighting function is, the psychological impact, you are behaving as if you just don't understand the probability. So what Kahneman and Tversky say is that for either very, for very low probabilities, people may round them to zero. And for very high probabilities, they may round them to one. But if they decide not to round them to zero or one, they exaggerate the difference between zero and one. You just can't think in terms of a continuum of probabilities. So this is what the weighting function, this is the weight as a function of the probability. For low probabilities, it's zero. I'm going to maybe exaggerate it here. Then it jumps up, and it's, it's something like this. And as it gets close to one, it jumps up to one again. So you see, it's like a, a broken line segment. Uh, and it, it, there's been various versions of this theory, but this is the simplest version of it. So that means, if you're getting on an airplane, okay, uh, you think, well, what's the probability of this airplane crashing? Well, you, you know, it's probably something like one in 10 million, or what is it, even less than that. Uh, so most of us in our mind just say, it's zero, and I'm done. I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to worry about it. And so we're down here, we've rounded <coughs> it to zero. But some people don't round it to zero, okay? And for them, they just blow it out of all proportion in their minds, and it becomes exaggerated. So I have it here, so it looks like it's a half. So this would be one here. And this is about 0.4. And then, ultimately, if the probability gets really high, then I'm not even going to think about it. It's one, okay? So, you know, it's a little bit like people, in some of the most primitive languages in the world, there's only a couple of numbers. There's zero, there's one, and maybe there's two or three, and then there's no more numbers. Well, you know, our minds are still very primitive in dealing with, with probabilities. So it's like there's only three probabilities. Can't happen, maybe, and will happen, okay? So I think airline flight insurance is an example of trying to manipulate this personality characteristic. So uh, it means that uh, uh, they'll catch all the people who exaggerate it, right? They, they, they used to have vending machines outside of airlines. Uh, the vending machines would uh, would encourage you to, to buy just for this flight. As you're getting, they put it right there when you're getting on the flight. And so that's when you're most nervous, if you're one of these people who's up here. And of course, most people don't buy, but they don't have to sell it to everybody. They just sell it to these people, and they charge an outrageous price. But I haven't seen these vending machines anymore. This is interesting. Uh, the economists wrote about them 30 or 40 years ago, and they used to be everywhere. And they just kind of disappeared. Do you ever see one of these? I think they're gone. Why is that? Well, somehow we get past things like that. And so it's not like Kahneman and Tversky are immutable, are rep re representing immutable errors. These are errors that you naturally uh, happen, but, but you, can, uh, you can get past it. And you, you, can, you end up wanting to deal with people you trust. So you see some vending machine at the airport and you think, well, my insurance agent isn't recommending I get this, and I've got some kind of insurance, so you walk past it. There's a, a professor in Germany uh, at, the, uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, Gerd Gigerenzer, who has been taking on Kahneman and Tversky and saying that they're right that people show these tendencies for errors but I can train people out of them with no problem. Those errors, uh, I just tell them this is an error, teach them then, and they don't do it anymore. Uh, and uh, so, uh, oh, uh, Gary Gorton just did a seminar here on um, uh, errors that people make in financial. I'm not, not uh, Nick Barbaris here on the SOM, and he was using uh, Caltech students uh, and found that, and, and, and tested their ability to uh, uh, prevent certain kind of errors like this, and he found that even the Caltech students made these errors just horribly. 
we were wondering, aren't they supposed to be bright? Those are <laughs> young math geniuses. But about a third of them got everything right. So I'm thinking, you know, they're only undergraduates, right? By the time they get along, if they go, they'll eventually be trained out of these errors. But right now, they're behaving just like uh, the psych behavioral finance says it will. So, um, so anyway, I think that you will find that prospect theory explains a lot of things that go on in finance, but it doesn't explain everything. Uh, and let me move on. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, let me see, what do I? Well, uh, I have so many things to tell you about here, uh, and I'm thinking about my time. It's a huge field, behavioral finance. Let me mention a few other things. Regret theory is a theory that uh, it's kind of related to Kahneman and Tversky. It says that people fear the pain of regret. There's an old expression, I was kicking myself because I made some bad decision. Well, that's a painful experience. When you did something wrong, it's, th this is represented somewhat in the kink in the prospect theory value function. But regret theory says that there's actually a painful emotion that you're wired not to like to have made a mistake. And so then you end up designing your r life around that and trying to avoid doing anything that you might regret later. And it can, it can create uh, problems. Uh, you may make bad decisions because you're overly worried about regret. Gambling behavior. Uh, anthropologists have reported that gambling occurs in every human society. Uh, and so it's one of the human universals. Not that everyone does it, but in every society, you'll find people that, that do it. Uh, in a, I have a 1974 study. Uh, I uh, found that 61% of uh, U.S. adults actually gambled at least once for money uh, in that year. I, I bet it has gone up. There's more opportunities for gambling, and it's gone up. 1.1% uh, of men are compulsive gamblers, and 0.5% of women. This is another male trait. Uh, somehow, men are more vulnerable to compulsive gambling than women, but it's only a factor of two to one. Uh, but it, it's an addiction that happens that uh, distorts people's thinking. And it's such an addiction that we have an organization called Gamblers Anonymous that uh, helps people with this. It ruins people's lives. People end up getting a divorce because you can't stay with someone, married to someone who is squandering the family money. They do it, they end up sneaking around to gamble, like drinkers sneak around for the next drink. It's, oh, uh, it, it's gambling behavior, is, uh, it, it seems to be associated psychologically with a self-image, a sense of who I am and why I'm an important and good person, a sense of competence, most gamblers uh, do things that they think are revealing of their competence, and they tend to pick a certain form of gambling that, that they become psychologically identified with, and they, they avoid any other form of gambling. Gambling behavior is part of what goes on in the stock market. <laughs> certain people who have a personality which makes them particularly interested in gambling find that a life in finance can give them the kind of stimulation. Gambling behavior, by the way, is, a, is, is almost like a drug addiction in a sense, that people who are depressed may go to a gambling casino as a way of getting themselves out of the depression. Uh, be, and they say that when they walk into the casino, Suddenly, my troubles are gone. I feel invigorated and alive. Uh, it's almost like it creates a hormonal difference in them that they seek, and they, it's almost like injecting yourself with something. So it's a very hard thing to conquer. Uh, I, I mentioned before how when, they, when the New York State in 1811 created the first corporate law that produced a lot of questionable companies, uh, people then said, this is just gambling. It's bad. 
But the other side of it is that the same gambling behavior, it's not usually a pathology. It's an aspect of human sensation seeking of various aspects of our psychology that drive us. What the stock market is, in some sense, is a way of channeling this kind of behavior into something productive instead of just a game. And so uh, they, they make it very clear in the stock markets of the world, this is about business and this is productive. The same emotions that emotional patterns that created gambling behavior as a human universal underlie some, this is not abnormal, it's most people, uh, underlie traits that, uh, that uh, work out well. Okay, the next major thing I wanted to talk about is overconfidence. Uh, and uh, psychologists have found that there's a human tendency to overestimate one's own abilities, okay? We all think, not all of us, most of us think we're above average. Uh, some of us think we're way above average. And this tendency has been revealed in a number of experiments. Uh, I thought I would try one on you. I don't know if it will work. <coughs> I'll try it on this class. Uh, but, uh, if you will participate in this experiment by a show of hands. I'm going to ask you, I have three questions here. Uh, and I want to ask you to uh, write down a 90% confidence interval. All right. Okay, do you have, you have a pencil to write this down? And, and then afterwards, I'm going to tell you the answer and see if it fell in your confidence interval. Okay, so this is what it is. What is a 90% confidence interval? It's a range of values so that you are 90% sure that the true value lies in this range, okay? So if I asked you for uh, what is the uh, uh, population of New Haven, uh, you might say, 90% confidence interval, that's between uh, 50,000 and 150,000. That means you're 90% sure that the population falls in that range. And so you should be right 90% of the time. That If I ask you to give 90% confidence intervals, you should be right. Nine times out of 10. If I ask for a 99% confidence interval, you have to widen the interval, <coughs> then you should be right 99 times out of 100. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you will cooperate with me, is give 90% confidence intervals for, uh, I have three questions I'm going to give you. Uh, but I have to ask you to be honest, otherwise it, this thing won't work. You could game me by just giving excessively wide confidence intervals, right? And then, you know, a, a, from zero to infinity. <laughs> then you'll always be right, but you're not playing honestly. So I have to re appeal to your character to do this honestly, okay? So I have three questions here. Um, I just uh, uh, changed the questions. I, uh, the first is, now what you have to write down on your note paper somewhere is your honest estimate of a 90% confidence interval. And so the first question is the world population. How many people are alive in the world? All right. At, uh, as of... Um, I think it was uh, 8 a.m. this morning. Uh, the, the U.S. Census has something called the World Population Clock. And it just go, uh, don't cheat. <laughs> don't, I know some of you have laptops. Don't do it. But after this, you can search Google on World Population Clock, and it shows you minute by minute how many people there are in the world. Every birth and death. They're not actually recording them. It's a fake, but I mean, it's supposed to be an estimate. So I got the world population. So what I want you to do, can you write down a lower bound and an upper bound for the world population this morning, uh, as measured by the U.S. Census? Okay, can you write that down? But I don't want you to make it too wide. Remember, I, I only want you to be 90% sure, and I don't want you to make it too narrow because then you're, uh, you're more likely to fail. So you've written that down, the world population? Okay, my next question is, uh, to the world. What does it weigh? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, well, actually, I want to, it's the mass in kilograms of the world. Can you write that down? Uh, this is uh, astronomy. Uh, okay, let me say, I'm asking for it in kilograms, but you can do it in metric tons. Uh, that just knocks off three zeros. A metric ton is a thousand kilograms, okay? Um, and just so you'll know for sure, uh, that's not the same thing as a long ton, uh, which is UK. The United Kingdom uses the long ton, which is 2,240 pounds. Uh, I just looked this up, and is 1.1 uh, metric tons. And it's not exactly the same as a short ton, which we use in the United States, which is 2,000 pounds, which is 0 0.98 metric tons. All right. Just tell me how many tons. It, it, that's not going to affect your 90% confidence interval, right? Just tell me how many tons does the Earth weigh, okay? All right, and then uh, that's the third, second. And I have one more question. How many languages are there in the world? Okay. Now uh, I know because uh, you might complain. This is a matter of definition because sometimes two dialects might be considered a separate language. Uh, well, I'm asking you to give me the number. The, the World Authority uh, on uh, Languages is uh, uh, an organization that has a website called ethnologue.com. And if you go to that website, uh, they're always discovering new language. They keep track of it. New languages keep getting discovered. Because, you know, some guy is hiking out in Siberia and they go to this little village and say, hey, these people are speaking a, a, a language that would no, never have been documented before. So it's this process of learning languages. They also keep dying out because uh, they're just elderly people in this village and when they die, you know this language is going to die with them. So anyway, the question is, I want your 90% confidence interval for the number of languages as defined by ethnologue.com, <laughs> okay? You have to guess how they define a language. Uh, but you have an idea, more or less, what a language is, right? It's, it's more than a dialect, because they can still understand each other if they speak different dialects. We're talking about really different languages. Okay, have you written down three confidence intervals? Okay, so I'm going to write down the answers. And I hope this works. It, 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 I'm trusting to your honesty in getting these things, because you could game me and make this not work. But give me your honest comp. So I, I'm going to write down the correct answer. So the world population, as of 8 a.m. this morning, uh, was 6,901,330,581. OK. Now, can I get a show of hands? How many people's confidence interval includes that number? Uh, okay, does someone tell me what percent that is? is that is not 90%. You're doing pretty well, though. What do you think, Oliver? You think it's 80? Uh, see him up again. Uh, maybe it is 80. All right, you're doing really well. <laughs> and that's, uh, some honest people here didn't put their hands up. <laughs> Good. All right, well, that's one. So we did 80 instead of 90. What about the weight of the Earth? Okay, uh, in kilograms. Well, uh, it's um, 5.974 times 10 to the 24th power. Uh, and I'll give you that in tons, in more familiar. It's 5,974 billion billion tons. Okay, you got that? You might have to do some calculation. <laughs> that would be 5.9734 times 10 to the 18th power. Okay, can we do a show of how many people had a number in, uh, how many people are in the confidence interval there? All right, Oliver, what do you think? What's the fraction? 10 per, okay. So this one, you did really well on world population. 80, 10. Well, the last one. How many languages are in the world? Well, according to ethnologue.com, there are 6,909 languages this morning. <laughs> okay. 
How many people got that within their confidence interval? Okay, what do you think, Oliver? 10%, okay. Why did you do so much better on world population? Well, thank you for being honest with me. I think it worked once again, uh, that um, the uh, overconfident. So why is it that uh, people are overconfident like this? And uh, psychologists have, uh, have tried to um, uh, describe what it is that goes on in people's minds that produces answers like this. W one of them is that people seem to have a sense that they understand the world more than they really do. It's an illusion. Actually, the world is just infinitely complicated and there are so many surprises. You, you have a, when you think about a question like this, there's many different perspectives that you can take. Uh, and if you thought more about it, you might, your imagination might help you to widen your confidence interval. But you can't think of all the perspectives at once. And so you, you tend to gravitate to the first one that comes to mind and it gives you a, uh, an underestimate of, of, the, uh, of the confidence, of the, uh, uh, um, so uh, that is overconfidence. By the way, I, I think it's a little bit higher in males than females. I didn't do a separate male-female count, but females are definitely overconfident. <laughs> that's a so-called macho personality that's supremely overconfident, which is, that's not in DSM-4, but uh, I don't think it is, but uh, it uh, is more common among males. But it's really everyone is overconfident, so it's not, uh, there's no, important sex difference here. Um, but incidentally, I think that overconfidence, and this is an important phenomenon, it goes beyond yourself. It extends to your friends. Uh, and you exaggerate. You, there's a tendency for people to think that I have very smart friends, <laughs> okay? Um, I, I was reflecting the other day when I was an undergraduate at University of Michigan. Uh, I was in the honors program, and we, we thought we were pretty smart. And uh, I had a number of young people that I just imagined were heading toward careers, really great careers. Uh, there was one student that we called Young Jack Kennedy. Because, well, you know, this was some years ago. Jack Kennedy was president of the United States. We thought he was a genius. That was probably wrong, too, right? There were none of these people are geniuses. Um, but I was thinking that uh, most of my friends ended up in very you know, good careers, but nothing, nothing that you would think was spectacular. I had one friend as an undergrad who I thought was a genius, uh, and uh, his name was Bruce Wasserstein. Anyone ever heard of him? Maybe not. Well, see, that's it. But he, he founded his own investment bank called Wasserstein Perella, became really rich, and then he bought uh, an interest in Lazard Frere, the... Uh, French Investment Bank, uh, and he was a real big shot on Wall Street. I met him again about uh, 10 years ago, and then he died. God, <laughs> he had a heart attack uh, and died. So I know his whole life. I saw him when he was 18, and I, I've watched his whole life, and it's now history. It's kind of scary, but, um, but I remember thinking he was a genius as an undergrad. Uh, but why, I was wondering, what was wrong with my judgment? Why did I see so many other geniuses? Uh, and he maybe. Uh, I thought he, now that I think back on it, he had a sort of real-world common sense that amazed me. Uh, he, uh, he just knew things that, it wasn't fake knowledge, he seemed to know how things worked. So I guess I was right about one of them. But not enough that you, none of you have heard of him, right? <laughs> anyway, he has an investment bank named after him, right? You should have heard of him, but maybe not. Um, but anyway, th this thing affects people's thinking, too. I think that we tend to think that the head of state who's running, the, the head of our central bank is a genius. Uh, and this really clouds our thinking. It's not just confident. It, it's like our ego extends to the other people that are, we associate with ourselves. Now, the head of a central bank in another country, we have no respect for. <laughs> it's only in our own country, because it's part of our ego involvement that produces this overconfidence. So. Um, uh, so this produces a lot, this tendency for overconfidence produces a lot of anomalies and opportunities for manipulation. Uh, so, for example, Rakesh Khurana, 
uh, who is a professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, has written a book uh, called Search for the Charismatic CEO. And he, claim, uh, see, he claims that there's a tendency for people to think that CEOs are geniuses, or that at least the one that we found is a genius. Uh, and companies then seek out a genius CEO to put in charge of the company as a kind of manipulation of the stock market. They think if we get, you know, if we got uh, some guy who's uh, 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 run other companies successfully in the past, he must be a genius. Put him in our company, our stock price will go up. Then we can sell our uh, executive, uh, we can exercise our options and make a lot of money uh, by putting in this fake genius. And uh, Karana says, well, there are some people who are maybe geniuses at management, but most of the time they're just lucky. And uh, we tend to develop overconfidence. And then what happens, according to Karana, is you put in some guy who turned around some company spectacularly, supposedly. You bring him in to run a new company, and he doesn't know anything about this new company, right? But uh, he has to justify himself. So he lays off a lot of people and shuffles things around and just destroys everything in the company and ruins things. Um, this is related uh, to another uh, author that I recommend. I mentioned him before, I think. Uh, Nassim Taleb wrote a book called Fooled by Randomness that uh, uh, he's Lebanese, but now in the U.S. Uh, Nassim Taleb, Fooled by Randomness, uh, that says that uh, most of the things that happen in life are just chance. And uh, we tend to ascribe them. If they happen to us, we conclude, we're very quick to conclude that it's a sign of our own genius. Uh, and if it happens to someone that is a friend of us, then you think, well, I have genius friends. Isn't that nice? Uh, and so it leads to mistakes. Uh, OK, let me go to a, another, uh, how much time do I have? Cognitive dissonance. This is another psychological principle. Um, the term was coined by sociologist Leon Festinger uh, in the 1950s, I believe. I actually met this guy. Uh, the nice thing about being in academia, you meet all these great names if you're in long enough, eventually. Um, but what is cognitive dissonance? It's a, it's a judgmental bias that people tend to make because they don't want to admit they're wrong. Maybe I'm oversimplifying this mistake. It's painful to think that I believed something and it was wrong. So uh, people will cling to old beliefs and try to find evidence that supports their belief because they have an ego involvement with the belief. And, uh, and so I will be biased. The, the famous experiment indicating cognitive dissonance done by some psychologists had the following form. They got a list of people who had just bought a car, and they knew what make of car. They, they got the list from car dealers, so they knew exactly what car they had just bought. And they called these people up and asked them to participate in a psych experiment, or it, I think they said a marketing experiment. But they didn't let them know that they knew what car they had just bought. And then they, when the experiment was the following. Let's go through a number of, what magazines do you read? Uh, and they said, let's get these out. They got all the magazines that were on the newsstand. And they said, let's look through page by page and tell us which ads you remember reading. And what they found is that people read the ads for the car they just bought, okay? And they avoided, especially, the car that they thought they might buy but decided not to buy. So after you buy a car, you want to confirm your belief in it. So you selectively get information that confirms your belief. Uh, and so this uh, cognitive dissonance is another factor. It's been demonstrated. It's an error that people make. It doesn't mean that people, again, again, none of these errors is inviolable. People will make the error, and then they'll learn from their mistakes, and they'll correct. They, they, they're not totally cognitive dissonant. 
but it's just a kind of error that keeps coming up. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples of cognitive dissonance and its effects on finance. So Will Getzman uh, is a professor here at the Yale School of Management, and a couple of his co-authors found that mutual fund investors, uh, when, a f when a mutual fund does very badly in its investment performance, uh, many or most investors sell the stock and get out of it, but some of them hang on. And they thought that that was due perhaps to cognitive dissonance, because I bought this fund, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to sell because, because uh, <laughs> I was right. Well, one, so what they did is they interviewed these people, and they found out that these people didn't even know how badly the fund has done. They had blocked it out, and they had an exaggerated impression, uh, which, um, which uh, uh, an exaggerated impression of the success, which is characteristic of cognitive dissonance. You just forget the evidence that's contrary to your your theory, and you keep assembling evidence that supports your theory. Uh, I have another example of cognitive dissonance, uh, and this one was produced by a professor. Sandil Mullenathan at the Harvard Economics Department. Uh, and Mullenathan looked at financial advisors uh, and his co authors. Uh, they, um, what they did to study, that's a whole big profession. I remember at the beginning I pointed out how many hundreds of thousands of financial advisors there are. What they did, it's an interesting experiment, they hired actors to go to financial advisors and ask for their help. And the, the experiment was the following. Uh, the, the, they would say the same thing to each financial advisor, but the, but the different actors would present their existing portfolio differently. In other words, you'd go to the advisor and you'd say, I have a portfolio of uh, uh, investments, and I'm almost entirely in money market funds. That's all. You just say that, and you wouldn't express any opinion at all. Another actor would go and say, I've got all of my portfolio in tech stocks, right? Uh, or I've got all of my portfolio in options. Now, what should advisors tell people? Well, if they were acting really professionally, they should question the assumptions that made the actor, supposedly, put all of their money in one kind of investment. Um, and many of the financial advisors did, but usually they didn't. They didn't question the, uh, the actor. The, they assumed that the actor was per who had put supposedly all of the investments in, uh, in money market funds was someone who was very risk averse or, uh, uh, or thought that was the right thing to do, and they didn't want to challenge them. So they would walk out of there with maybe a slightly different mix of money market funds. And somebody else who was in a very risky portfolio, they didn't challenge them. Uh, and uh, they even sent actors in with almost all of their portfolio in their own company's stock. All right? Now, if you work for Ford Motor Company, I know this is my uncle. <laughs> I had conversations with him about this, who worked for Ford Motor Company and put all of his life savings in Ford Motor Company. And I said, Uncle Ralph, you shouldn't do that. Because it's your job and all of your life savings. What if something happened to Ford Motor Company? Fortunately, he didn't work for GM, which <laughs> became worthless recently. But it can happen. You know, Ford could be completely wiped out. That's your life savings. And you know what he said to me? He said, you know, I've worked at Ford all my life. They treat me well. I believe in them. I'm not going to sell. And, uh, so there's lots of people like that. So when they show up at a financial advisor, the first thing that they should do, the financial advisor should tell them, get out of you know, your Ford style. You, you can't, that's just too risky. But only 40% of the financial advisors did that. The 60% left them in, mostly in their own company stock. Why did they do that? Well, Mullenathan thought it's because the advisors know there's co cognitive dissonance and they're afraid to drive away a new client. Maybe they'll gradually do it over a while, but you just don't challenge their deep beliefs 
whatever they say is true. And so they're kind of yes men, not all of them. And maybe they'll come around. And it, it, it relates then again to a moral dilemma. If you are a financial advisor working in private practice, what do you do with people uh, who come to you if you know from experience that challenging their deep-seated beliefs will drive them away? So in the real world, this is again, I'm not sure that these financial advisors are doing the wrong thing. If, if they would eventually tilt them toward a more responsible portfolio, they can't drive them away. So, uh, uh, let me, uh, uh, I have a lot of, I have so many, of it. Let, me, let me list some of the others and move on. Uh, what else should I talk about? Anchoring. Uh, anchoring is a uh, principle that people, uh, anchoring re refers to uh, a tendency to anchor your opinions on something that captures your attention. The, the famous anchoring experiment by, it was again uh, Kahneman and Tversky, uh, they, they, they asked, it says, I, I could almost do this experiment here in class with you if I had a wheel of fortune. A wheel of fortune is like on a game show. You spin the wheel and it comes up with a number between zero and a hundred in this, in this particular uh, wheel of fortune. So this is the experiment. They asked their subjects, uh, how many people, it had to be something that are, it had an answer from zero to a hundred. One of their questions was, how many nations uh, in the world belong to the United Nations, okay? So they, they asked the question, they said, don't answer me just yet. Think about that question. How many, what percent of nations in the world belong to the United Nations? Then they spun the wheel and it came up and it showed a random number. And then they asked people for the answer. Well, it turns out that people tended to give an answer close to the number that just came up on the wheel. This is totally irrational, right? It has not, that wheel has nothing to do with the answer, and yet people were influenced by it. So then they would follow up and ask them, yeah, hey, that number you gave is the same as the way it just came up on the wheel, or it's close to it. Why did you do that? The guy would say, just coincidence. I wasn't influenced by the wheel. Of course not. But you know they were, because statistically they proved that they were. So anchoring means that people are attracted to, uh, uh, they're affected by subconscious uh, uh, things that, you know, not, I shouldn't say subconscious, they didn't make a logical connection. When you face real ambiguity and you don't know the answer, you've got to come up with a decision, you are swayed by the most silly and random things. There's the representativeness heuristic. Uh, this, is, uh, this is also Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, and that is that people overemphasize certain patterns that they think are representative of what they've seen before. So, for example, certain patterns in the stock market that, they, that may be very rare and unusual, but if they remember it, if it somehow attracted their attention, they begin to look for that pattern again and again, uh, and they see it too often. Uh, so, for example, head and shoulders, we talked about that that McGee um, talked, the, the technical analyst, he saw the head and shoulders pattern in the stock market and he saw that it crashed after that. But actually it's pretty hard to find those, they're kind of rare. And it's not the right way to process data to be looking for patterns that are representative. And it invites manipulation. So I'll give you some other bad behavior. If people believe in the head and shoulders, if they believe that the head and shoulders pattern of stock price movements predicts a decline, Here's what I can do. I'll take some thinly traded stock. I'll get a friend. We'll trade back and forth and we'll influence the price to create, we'll deliberately create a head and shoulders pattern, okay? And then we'll short the stock massively right at the time when the head and shoulders pattern would give a, uh, a sell signal, right? We can make tons of money doing that. Right? So why don't we do that? Well, we don't because uh, it's a manipulation. Is this thing off? Uh, the battery just died. I'll talk loud because I'm coming to the end. Can you hear me through louder talking? Uh, uh, 
I want to then just conclude with uh, social contagion because it's so important. This is my last, uh, and this is really uh, social psychology. <laughs> I'm running out of room here. That's social contagion. Social psychology reflects on the fact that people are interdependent and what I think is affected by what others think. Um, uh, th there's something called herd behavior. Uh, that's a popular term. It refers to the tendency for people to uh, move with the herd. <laughs> Not consciously. They don't think that they're moving with the herd. I might bring up a little sociology here. Uh, and I'll use a term. Uh, everything has been psychology, but uh, the great sociologist, one of the founders of the discipline of sociology was the French scholar Emile Durkheim. Uh, at the late 19th, early 20th century. And he used the word collective consciousness. Uh, and that is that our opinions about what's happening are formed by a collective understanding of what's going on. We think of ourselves, we have a tendency to think of ourselves as uh, rational and common sense. Uh, all of our views come from common sense processing of facts. I, I do what I, I have a sense of belief about what goes on in the world, but I underappreciate the extent to which my views are a little bit arbitrary and shared by millions of other people. You live at a certain point in time in history, and there are certain kinds of facts and ideas and anecdotes that are circulating, uh, there's a, another term is there's a zeitgeist. Uh, that's German, but it's now English. That means spirit of the times. Uh, so what Durkheim and other sociologists allowed us to understand is that the zeitgeist is determined by a collective memory, a collective set of facts that we operate on. This herd behavior creates big swings in the stock market and other things. So it has huge financial impact. Uh, but what, anyway, I've, I've listed a number of behavioral finance principles that really come from psychology. And I've talked about some tests or examples of their proof of their importance in psychology, but in, in finance. But what do we c conclude from this? I think that uh, my conclusion is that we are evolving toward better and better financial institutions. There is a lot of manipulation and exploitation. But we as a society have outlawed a lot of things. For example, when I mentioned that doing a, a, a stock market manipulation trick to create a head and shoulders pat pattern, that is an offense. Get you in jail for doing that. And, and they, we prosecute that now. So you can't do that. Our, uh, I'm going to talk more about this in the next lecture about regulation. But it's also people's moral judgments that the people who evolve to become important in finance are people who have an internal compass, that, uh, a desire for praiseworthiness that, that eliminates uh, the. I'm, I'm going to give just two examples of some recent uh, uh, articles about this. In um, the latest, in the current issue, of the uh, Harvard Business Review uh, that I assume is still on newsstands. Uh, this is Harvard Business Review. There's an article by Michael Porter uh, and uh, co-author uh, Mark Kramer. Uh, Porter is a well-known professor at Harvard uh, in which he argues that we're coming to realize more and more about a principle called, he calls it shared value, or they call it shared value. Uh, and that is that the manager of a company is not going to be, as, shouldn't be underestimating the importance of shared value creation 
with society, with other people. Uh, that is, we're all in this together, and if we're mature, uh, we recognize, for example, that I don't want to be exploitative. I don't want to make the local people in my town upset with our company. I don't want our labor force to be, become disenchanted. Now, what he's saying is not really about morals exactly. It's more about long-term value. But I guess morals somehow creeps into the same judgment. That mature business people see shared value and that there was maybe less and not enough emphasis on it. There was too much financial theory was leading us too much toward thinking that a, a manager should be selfishly pursuing a narrow focus, like man, ma maximizing the short run value of their shares. Anyway, uh, the other example I have, which is also recent, not quite as recent as that, is a book that came out last year uh, by Anna. Bernasek, who is actually a journalist, not an ac academic, uh, but it's called uh, The Economics of Integrity. Is that the title exactly? Um, yes, right. Economics of Integrity. <coughs> and that means, what, what her point in that book is that uh, a sense of personal integrity has dominated what people do in the business world much more than we thought recently. There, was, there has been too much disregard of the fact that people do things because they're right. Well, she gives an example in the book, and I'll close with this concept. She said, let's consider milk, okay? Now, you drink milk regularly, I hope. <laughs> it's good for you. But it could poison you. Uh, people used to get sick from drinking contaminated milk. Uh, and you don't ever hear of anyone getting sick. So she says, why is that? Well, we have government regulation of milk production. Uh, and uh, there are laws uh, about purity of milk. But when she, get, she looked into it and found that, actually, she didn't think it was mostly the regulation. She thought that you are safe drinking milk because of the integrity of our people, mostly. That if you go to some milk company and talk to the employees, they may not generally even know about the regulations. But if you ask them, they'll tell you, I mean, are you careful to keep this milk clean? They'll tell you, well, someone's going to drink this, so obviously it's common sense, I'll keep it clean. And what she says, it's not primarily the regulation. It's the integrity of the people that makes the economic system work as well as it has. So anyway, I've emphasized both sides. I've talked about human failings and about people exploiting these failings, about people with antisocial personalities. But we have a system that somehow eliminates this from being the major factor in our markets. <laughs>